So um, even though I uh, am an expert in astronomy, all of my um, stories today will be about planets, um, both um, outside our solar system and inside our solar system. Um, for those of you who um, were here, I think back in the November 60 Minutes in Space, um, this particular image um, was released and we talked about it. This is the young planetary system HL Tau, um, which is in the constellation of Taurus. And this is a, um, an observation from the ALMA radio, uh, millimeter radio um, array down in Chile. And what um, this shows is a central star with a protoplanetary disk. So this is a disk of gas and dust that's still funneled material to the central star, but presumably it's also forming planets in that disk. And these planets are large enough that they have created gaps in the disk. And so people count multiple, you know, um, depending on how you, um, you look at it, um, maybe four or five, um, definitely at least three major gaps in there. And um, this particular system is in um, a relatively small dark molecular cloud. Molecular clouds are places where stars are born. And HL Tau is just one of a number of protostars that have been discovered in this area. So you can see um, all the other young stars. And you don't see a lot of stars, and that's because um, there's a lot of gas and dust that's blocking the starlight. So you see a handful of stars poking through and they could either be um, foreground stars or they might be um, a single lone uh, background star, but um, you can tell that there's a lot of obscuration. But you also see um, hints of jets. So you can see jets here, and HL Tau itself has a jet coming out, and this is actually another sign that star formation is taking place for young stars. Not only do they have material falling down into the central star, but some of that material gets um, shot out as jets. And so there's um, the disk that was imaged by the ALMA um, array, and ALMA stands for the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, and Atacama is the desert down in Chile where they've set this up. Um, it turns out that uh, millimeter um, wavelengths are very sensitive to water in our atmosphere, and so you want a site as high and dry as possible to avoid contamination. Um, so the water and atmosphere actually block some of the radiation um, at the wavelengths that um, this, these radio telescopes are sensitive to. And um, the Atacama Desert, um, some of you might know, um, is one of the driest places in the world. Um, certain portions of the desert hasn't seen any rainfall in multiple decades. And so here um, is the information that we knew um, from back in November. Um, from the, um, the research team that originally released this, um, this particular uh, protostar along with um, its uh, potential planets are um, just under 500 light years away. And the resolution that they're seeing is about five astronomical units. So that's, um, this is about the distance between the sun and Jupiter. So that's the smallest bit of detail that we can see. And you can see our solar system uh, put to scale. This is Neptune's orbit relative to the HL Tau system. Now, once this was released, a lot of uh, people um, got interested in this particular system. And um, this is um, something that always happens in astronomy. Something makes the news, whether it actually makes it into the public eye or not. But then a lot of people will jump on a particular um, topic because it's hot and exciting. And so I'm, I'm actually going to be talking about two different papers. One is um, from a, um, a team led by Giovanni Di Piero. And if you look at this abstract, it basically says that they perform global three-dimensional dusty smooth particle hydrodynamics calculations of multiple planets embedded in dust gas disks, which successfully reproduce most of the structures seen in the ALMA image. And so what that means is they ran a computer simulation of this particular system. So they built it inside the computer. They um, had to include both gas and dust, and they um, managed to have results that um, replicate um, what we observe in the ALMA image. And one of the things that we don't observe in the ALMA image is what you see here. This is actually part of their simulation, but um, notice these features here. 
So you have these sparrow features. So there's supposed to be a planet here, and there's supposed to be a planet here, and I think there's supposed to be an inner planet down here as well, but there's supposed to be three planets. And this is actually very um, similar to other simulations that people have been running for many years. Whenever they have a gas disk um, of material that's fallen into the central star and they've removed the star just um, to make things less confusing, um, and you have gas that's also accreting um, or falling um, onto the planets that are forming around the star, you often find these spiral patterns um, looping away from the planets. And so we see this in simulation after simulation. And what's really puzzling is that when we look at that ALMA image, you know, clearly we have gaps that have been cleared out by possibly by planets, but we don't see the spiral structure. And so this um, is rather puzzling. Um, and so um, this is um, one issue that um, this paper will address. But um, what they did, and, and I was looking at the paper, and it wasn't entirely clear to me how they um, decided to choose uh, planetary masses that are two tenths, uh, about a quarter, and about half of a Jupiter mass. But they, um, it seems like they sort of arbitrarily chose those, and they um, worked out in the simulation. Um, but what they did was they um, ran the simulation with a model that had not only a, a gas um, disk, but um, dust as well. And when astronomers talk about dust, or planetary scientists talk about dust, they don't mean like the dust bunnies that you find underneath your bed or underneath <laughs> your refrigerator. Um, in astronomy, dust uh, means um, something very specific, and they are basically um, things that are much smaller than the dust that you can see in your household. Um, the, the dust tends to be on the order of microns in size, meaning a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. And so um, one um, type of object that you can think of that roughly corresponds to the dust that we see in space is cigarette smoke. So the particles that come off of burning paper or burning cigarette, um, those correspond to um, the dust that, um, that are, that's found in space. And dust is re released by stars. They um, um, grow over time. Um, they can accrete. And they find their way um, into these giant molecular clouds, like the one um, in Taurus that we um, just saw a picture of. And since these clouds have a lot of dust, the, um, the gas that falls in to form stars um, is presumed to also have a lot of dust as well. And it's this dust that it eventually um, accumulates to grow into planets. And so what they did in the simulation was to actually run the simulation um, using different dust sizes. So this is one with one micron, here's 10 microns, 100 microns, and 100 microns is roughly about the size of your, the, the width of your hair. So that's how, how small 100 microns is. One millimeter, and then finally um, to really big dust particles, one centimeter, and 10 centimeters. And what you notice is that the finest dust um, seems to follow the, uh, the pattern of the gas um, almost you know, very closely. So here is the gas in the model, and here is the dust. So you see the spiral pattern. And as we go to larger and larger dust sizes, um, this, you can sort of still see a hint of the spiral here and maybe here, but the spiral starts to disappear and starts to be replaced by more concentric gaps. What elements are the dust, is the dust made up of? What elements are the dust uh, made up of? Well, they're made up of all the elements uh, that are common in the universe um, that, that are not hydrogen and helium. And so dust tends to be made up of um, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And um, in places um, where um, Ices are um, thought to be common. Um, you also find um, dust um, with bits of like water ice or methane ice or ammonia ice. So they're um, basically elements that, um, that you would find in meteorites and um, in um, places like these molecular clouds. So they're, they're not super exotic, but um, what you can imagine them as being is they start out as clumps of these atoms and over time, they just keep growing and clump to be larger and larger.
until they get to micron size and larger. All right, so um, clearly um, what is happening, or perhaps what um, we are seeing is um, we are seeing the effects of not the small um, dust, which seems to track the gas very well, but we might be seeing the effects of um, larger dust. And so what they did was they um, took one of their simulation results and blurred it to compare it with the actual ALMA observation. So can you guess which of these two pictures is the real observation and which is their simulated one? So the real one is the little one on the left, and this is their simulated one. So they, so this is what they meant in um, when they're abstract when they said that they were able to basically come up with um, or simulate all of the um, the structures that um, that we see in the disk. Of course, what they had to do is they had to assume that there were um, three planets here, here, and here, and then they ran their simulation. And they were able to show that, um, in this case, this is the one um, uh, this is the one millimeter dust uh, that they um, tilted and uh, blurred to um, simulate the scene um, in the Alma image. Um, but they um, they assumed the the three um, planet masses that we saw earlier ran um, had the planets orbit, and the planets um, interacted with the dust, so they um, both accreted and um, the dust um, in disks like this can actually also shift uh, orbits of planets, um, but um, there was very minimal shifting in this case. So at, at least based on this simulation, it shows that um, planets could um, have caused the gaps that we see. Yeah, this is one millimeter. And of course, this is not an, a completely accurate depiction of what um, is actually happening in um, this disk because we expect um, dust um, to come in a range of sizes, not just um, one millimeter. So this is, um, but um, it turns out that um, this, um, it, it's useful to show just the one millimeter uh, version of the model because um, this particular observation was taken at 1.6 millimeter wavelength. And it turns out that the dust that um, will be emitting most at that particular wavelength will be roughly about one millimeter in size. So the observations themselves um, should be coming from, I mean, we expect it to come from dust at about that size range. So um, this all sort of makes sense. So this is completely consistent with planets um, having formed these gaps, but can we actually observe those planets? And that um, leads us to this um, next paper, Hunting for Planets in the HL Tau Disk. Um, led by a, um, a team um, led by Leonardo Testi. And one of the, um, the problems with the HL Tau system is that um, all indications that we have is that it's a relatively young um, protostar, meaning um, it's probably less than about a million years old based on our observations of the star and its environment. And part of the problem here is that there, um, there's a couple of different ways in which we think giant planets can form. One um, that people have thought of traditionally is um, the formation takes a really long time where the, um, the dust grains um, stick together and they grow from pebble size or you know microscopic to maybe pebble sized to rock size to boulder size and they um, keep accreting and growing larger and larger until you get earth sized planets and then giant um, Jupiter like planets. But this process can take hundreds of millions of years, or um, at least tens of millions of years, up to about 100 million years for Earth-sized planets. And obviously, um, if it takes that long through this sort of um, very slow process, you shouldn't expect planets in um, a system that's no more than a million years old. Alternatively, there is a, another scenario a, um, that theorists um, had come up with where the disk um, is so large that it becomes unstable and parts of the disk just collapse to form planets. And um, this process is much faster and planets can actually form within a million years or so. Um, and so it would be quite a coup to actually find planets in the system because then you could actually have 
some evidence for this disk collapse model. Because remember, this is a completely theoretical uh, model. Um, we haven't actually observed um, this yet. And so what the, um, this particular team did was they um, d actually did an observational search for planets in HL Tau, and they went to the largest telescope that they had access to, which was the Large Binocular Telescope. This is um, on top of Mount Graham in southeastern Arizona. So it's about an hour or two um, away from Tucson. And as you can see, the Large Binocular Telescope is called that because there are two big mirrors. The, these are uh, mirrors about um, eight meters across, or actually slightly more than eight meters across. And um, just like the, um, the radio array um, that you saw um, earlier, um, the larger uh, or the more number of dishes that you can spread apart, the finer the detail that you can see. Uh, this is the same principle where these two mirrors um, combined can give um, detail that's equivalent to a single telescopic mirror that's 22 meters across. So just by their separation, they're able to see more detail. And the way um, the LBT works is it ha um, the light comes down from the sky and it hits the two primary mirrors and the light um, then gets redirected to um, some secondary mirrors. And the reason why they do that is that um, the secondary mirrors have a, uh, an active optics uh, system on it. And when you're looking at um, a star or any light uh, that comes from above the atmosphere and it's um, going through the atmosphere, our atmosphere blurs the light. Um, one way to think about it is if you um, go to a swimming pool and if you go down to the bottom of the swimming pool and look at, back up um, at the sky or at the people who are at the edge of the pool, you'll see that uh, the motion of the water on the surface distorts the image that you see. And so it's the same thing. Our atmosphere is moving around enough that it can cause distortions in the image. And so the idea behind the active optics is that it, um, it looks at a, uh, a bright guide star and it um, figures out what the distortions are and it reverses the distortions. And so there, um, there's a, um, the secondary mirror is this one down here. It's only about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half thick, so it's very thin. But what it has, it has, I think it's on the order of like four or 500 actuators that are controlled by magnets. And so you see these magnets on the surface. And the mirror changes shape because of these um, the push arms that push against these magnets um, up to about a thousand times per second. And so it alters the shape of the mirror to exactly counteract the effects of the atmosphere that um, ripples and causes the, um, the light to, um, to, to move around. And so here is a, an example of what this looks like. So here we're seeing um, without correction and with correction. So um, you're seeing what looks like a double star but because the atmosphere is moving around so much, let's look at this again, the light from those two stars gets blurred around. Um, so it's just like um, looking out from the swimming pool and you can imagine the, um, the picture, um, the view that you have of people or deck chairs gets shifted around. And so that's why the light gets smeared. But um, once you have that um, active optics, you get this really nice, um, stable um, image. So um, they had to, it turns out that even with that, they weren't able to detect anything in the system. And so they had to use one other trick. So they had a really large telescope. They had active optics. Um, what they did was they looked at the system at two um, slightly different wavelengths. So uh, this is the K band, which is in the near infrared. And this is the L prime band, which is um, also in the near infrared, but it's even further into the red. So the wavelengths are even um, uh, longer than the K band. And it turns out that based on the models of um, young um, planets around these protostars, you would expect the planet to show up more in this redder band, in the L prime band, than in the K band. So basically what they did was they took 
um, two exposures, one in K and one in L, and they also um, masked out the central star because um, that's going to um, swamp the effects of any planet that um, you want to see. And then what they did was they subtracted these two. And the idea is um, you want to subtract the residual um, glow from the disk um, and the dust that's um, still emitting at these wavelengths. And this is their um, subtracted image where they took the L prime um, image and subtracted the K band. And so superimposed is where the star is supposed to be and where the gaps are supposed to be based on the, um, the ALMA image. And what they find is nothing. I mean, there's no obvious um, planet um, anywhere in this image. There was also a reported um, planet made by another um, team that um, was supposed to be over here where this green um, circle is, and they also didn't find any evidence of a planet. But that doesn't mean there um, aren't planets in the system. It turns out that they can place limits on um, what planets there could be. Um, they know that the planets, um, they don't find any ev evidence for planets greater than about 10 to 15 Jupiter masses because that's kind of the limit in which they would be able to, to see. And fortunately, um, there's also the issue that um, planets um, less than um, 10 times Jupiter's mass are problematic because they are not massive enough to um, clear gaps in the disk. Now, um, so that this almost suggests that there, um, there couldn't be any planets in the system, but the authors point out that there could be um, other solutions. One is that um, perhaps the planets are smaller, but um, because, again, the, um, if you look at the ALMA image, remember what I said, this um, image is um, sensitive um, to dust at one millimeter. And so if we're seeing dust um, at one millimeter, perhaps um, it's um, th this dust that has been affected by the smaller planets. And it turns out that smaller planets could um, cause um, gaps in, the in one millimeter dust, whereas it wouldn't necessarily um, cause uh, the same sort of structures forming at other wavelengths. And so basically the authors point out that even though they have a negative detection, it doesn't entirely rule out planets. And so it is still possible to have planets anywhere from 0.2 to um, half a Jupiter mass. And this is entirely consistent with the first paper that we talked about because those were the masses that were entered into their particular model. So. This is basically science in action, and um, you know, in astronomy, like any other science, we don't always have a firm, definitive um, solution to or an answer to our questions. Um, and this is um, an example of how messy science can be. We had results that came out in November. A bunch of people jumped on it, and in less than a year later, they had um, more results, both um, via computer simulations as well as observations, but it's still not entirely clear that we have confirmations of planets in this particular system.